Hello YouTube and welcome again to my channel. This time I thought I would talk about what it's like to have a conversation with a semi-awake Jehovah's Witness. I am basing this on a conversation I have had with a semi-awake Jehovah's Witness. Now, before I begin this video, you have to understand that semi-awake means they are still suffering from some pretty serious mind control. And it can be pretty interesting once you realize just how severe and how deep that mind control is. For those of us who have had discussions with uh, under the influence or totally indoctrinated witnesses, we know roughly how bad that is. But there's a number of things that Jehovah's Witnesses do that are completely and totally outside the realm of logic. For example, they have a blatant double standard, and I think later on I may do an entire video just about that. And they make some sweeping assumptions without any real justification for those assumptions. And they... Uh, well, they treat the organization as if it were God. And that'll... Um, I've discussed that before. But anyways, with those things in mind, I'm going to discuss the conversation that I had a little bit and kind of talk about how those things played in. So with this semi-awake Jehovah's Witness, I was trying to help them to see in full what is going on in the organization. And I don't remember the exact order of the discussion, but a couple of interesting things came up. And one of the things, of course, was the false prophecies. And one of my questions to that person was, how can the witnesses possibly be, not be false prophets? You were there when they made the prediction from the generation that would not pass away that saw the events of 1914. The response to that is, well, they've had false expectations before, wrong expectations. I said, well, but this is God's organization. You have seen in the Insight book the fact that speaking in someone's name indicates speaking as a representative of that person, which means they speak in God's name. You have also seen in the Insight book that claiming to be directed by spirit is the same thing as claiming inspiration. So the organization that is speaking in the name of God, that claims to be inspired by him, put these things in print, and they preach them as if they were the words of God. And the response was, well, they've had wrong expectations, so that's happened from time to time. So then I said, well, if those are just wrong expectations, then that means it would be okay for you to raise your hand at the Watchtower study and comment and say, you know, this overlapping generation seems kind of stupid to me. I really think the proper understanding was the generation that saw the events of 1914 that would not pass away. And that's kind of when it started to sink in. It's kind of like, oh, oh, well, that makes sense. But there's a lot of fog that has to be cut through. Another topic of conversation was the faithful and discreet slave. And the question was posed, how do you know that they're the faithful and discreet slave. The answer was, well, the Bible says there's going to be a faithful and discreet slave. So I said, okay, well, yeah, but how do you know that they're the faithful and discreet slave? What proves that they are? Oh, well, the Bible says there's going to be one. So if you break down this train of thought, I'll get into my answer later, but if you break down into this train of thought, what you see here is massive circular reasoning. So the assumption is they are the faithful and discreet slave because they say they are the faithful and discreet slave. And since you believe God's organization is talking for God, to question them becomes akin to questioning God. And that enables the circular reasoning. So again, I pose the question, no, what proves that they're the faithful and discreet slave and not somebody else? I said, and if you don't know the answer, I can tell you because I know the literature. And if this particular person didn't know the answer, it might be because they were caught off guard, but I explained to them. Well, the reason why they're the faithful and discreet slave is because they discerned the sign of 1914, and then when Christ came to inspect the temple, he found them to be doing his will, and that is why he chose them as the faithful and discreet slave in 1919, after they discerned that sign. I said, but... That raises the whole issue of 1914. And how do we know the Bible even pointed to 1914? 
And how do we know the seven times related to what Jesus said? The answer was, well, in Revelation it talks about seven times. And of course, that is not true. Revelation talks about three and a half times in two different places, but it doesn't talk about seven. And on top of this, Daniel chapter 4 refers to the seven times as being fulfilled upon Nebuchadnezzar with no indication at all that there is to be any future fulfillment. So I said, why are we to believe that there should be any other fulfillment of the seven Gentile times? I said, when did Jesus refer to seven Gentile times? And I just got, kind of got a blank look. So what happens with Jehovah's Witnesses is that they begin to assume that all these things that they're taught are actually in the Bible. So they really believe that the seven Gentile times are what Jesus was talking about because it was somehow in his Sermon on the Mount or, or some other place that that's what he was talking about. Well, not Sermon on the Mount, but when he was uh, the Olivet Discourse, I think is what that's called. But when you press them, it becomes obvious that the answer is no. That's not what Jesus was talking about. That's not in this discourse. And there is no reference to such a thing. And then, in addition to that, of course, is the fact that the weight of historical evidence, the irrefutable weight of historical evidence, proves that Jerusalem could not have been destroyed in 607. It had to be 586 or 587. The only question in the year is because the Bible lists two years as the date for the destruction. So, that was addressed. And linking together the fact that the faithful and discreet slave appointment comes from the fact that they determined 1914. If 1914 is wrong, well then, they're not appointed as the faithful and discreet slave. In addition to that, of course, is the fact that Jesus was telling a parable about the faithful and discreet slave, and it was not a prophecy. So these are all things that were discussed. At the end of the discussion, this particular person's eyes were more open than they were before. And I also explained the whole point of going to meetings all the time. They already knew that they heard the same thing over and over and over again at the meetings. I said, that's part of indoctrination. It was, uh, I think, Joseph Goebbels, the propaganda minister for the Nazis, said, if you repeat the lie often enough, it becomes the truth. So I, I told this person, I said, the reason why it's a sin for you to miss meetings to them, or why they get concerned, is because when you stop hearing the same type of thing over and over and over, the indoctrination can start to wear off. Your eyes can start to open. That is why it is so important for them that you attend every single meeting. So that helps to open their eyes a little bit as well. And after the conversation, their eyes were once again more so open. However, this particular person, their entire life is centered around being one of Jehovah's Witnesses. And here is the catch, is that if you are a good Jehovah's Witness, your life will be centered around being one of Jehovah's Witnesses. So, when you open your eyes and you see what's going on, you realize that you have to walk away from your entire life. All of your friends, all of your social activities, that's all gone. You don't have any other friends to go to if you're a good Jehovah's Witness because you don't associate with people who aren't Jehovah's Witnesses. They are called worldly people. Worldly people are looked down upon and even if they're good people they're still considered to be not servants of Jehovah and therefore they're dangerous because they might draw you away from serving Jehovah. So when a true believer as Jehovah's Witnesses has their eyes opened it's a very scary prospect. All of a sudden, they find themselves living in a parallel universe where everything they know is entirely wrong, and they don't necessarily know how to go about putting their life back together or even starting a life, because they have all these harmful mechanisms that were installed by the cult. And they're so used to being in the cult that all they can do is talk about cult things, think cult thoughts, and it's scary to have to start to think your own thoughts for the first time in perhaps decades. So, many of us perhaps have individuals that we would like to talk to and that we would like to wake up. And it is not 
an easy task. There's a lot of factors that go into it. The only reason why I was able to talk to this particular individual is because of who I used to be in the cult, because of how high I had risen, I guess you could say. And that conferred me the honor that this individual knew that I was not just, uh, hadn't just gone off the deep end, but they knew, they knew me well enough to know that my ideas are well thought out, well researched, and so on and so forth. And also this individual has seen some of the things I've dealt with in life. So they afford me that respect because of that. But for uh, a lot of us, uh, and even for a lot of people that I know, in fact most people that I know, those things still would not make a difference. So any time that you decide to have a conversation with an indoctrinated witness, you are taking a big risk because once you start talking about things that put the organization in a bad light, right away warning signs go off in their head and their first instinct is to stop talking to you and to run to the elders as fast as they possibly can. That is the way they've been indoctrinated. Because the organization knows that if people are allowed to see the truth, if they're allowed to think for themselves, it becomes very obvious what's been done to them. So that's kind of the story. Uh, it's, it, it's not easy to talk with people and you're taking a big risk when you do because they are trained to shut their minds off as fast as they possibly can when something comes up that demonstrates that what they believe is not the truth and that the governing body is not the faithful and discreet slave and that the Watchtower is not God's organization. So that's my video for this time. Thanks for watching.